something I can do to see everybody? Can you hear me? Yes, are we good to go? If you want to see everybody, go up to gallery and click on gallery. On an iPad, it's on the upper right. On a Mac, it's on the upper left, and I have no idea what you're on. Okay. As long as you're hmm. on the sauce. Got it. Hey, I guess we're all here. Amanda, are you ready to go? Yes, I'm ready. Since I don't have a gavel, I hereby call the June 8th meeting of the Traffic and Public Safety Commission to order. Amanda, could you please do a roll call? Yes, sir. Chair Peter Cole. Here. Vice Chair Brian Grover. Here. Mary Schultz. Here. Marty Benson. Here. Michael Here. Von Neumann. I couldn't hear that. Michael Von Neumann. Oh, that's me. I'm here. <laughs> Charlie Leishernes. Present. Glenn Johnson. Hey, Amanda, you sound like you're in a tunnel. Hmm. Well, I think, uh, I think you're hearing, Amanda, we had a situation here with a setup. I think you're hearing Amanda's voice from the microphone of my computer. So the fact that she's sitting on the other side of the chamber, that's why you're probably not hearing her well, because my system's microphone is what's catching her. Catching okay, her voice. Uh, I think uh, we will again dispense with the Pledge to Allegiance. Uh, so let's go to item number four, special presentations, et cetera, et cetera. The next meeting of the commission will be on July 13th. Hopefully it won't have to be Zoom again, but my guess is that it will be. If it's all your... Amanda, I don't have X drive here again. Good evening, commissioners. Um, thanks for uh, being here tonight. And um, as chair mentioned, still via Zoom, um, we we still don't have any kind of a clear um, uh, understanding of how how the future um, meetings will be uh, had will be held in the city. Um, but at the moment, the fact that uh, the majority of the city is still working from home, we got to assume that our next meeting will be via Zoom too. If anything changes, obviously, um, we'll we'll let you know. Uh, with regards to my regular updates, um, first one, South Coast Highway 101. Uh, the changes uh, are almost done. Most of the modifications are in. Uh, the only element left, um, the only major element left is the walkway on the west side of South 101 uh, between the bridge and the uh, Kraken signal. So that stretch on the west side will have a walkway. Uh, there is a guardrail that will be removed and a five footer walkway will be built adjacent to the current cycle track. Um, 
I, I noticed uh, that uh, some of the commissioners were uh, discussing about, uh, talking about the changes and discussing uh, what more we can do. Um, I'm planning on conducting a survey sometime soon uh, now that almost everything with our beach and parking over there is back uh, in operation. Conducting a survey and finding out um, what we're looking at with regards to how the cycle track is being utilized, um, the number of uh, pedestrian conflicts that we have, um, wrong direction, um, bicycle or pedestrian activity in the cycle track, um, to, to have a better understanding because I'm sure you agree that at the moment we're um, hearing more from um, the group of sports cyclists who did not like the project from the beginning uh, because of the fact that um, obviously uh, there was a very comfortable bike lane adjacent to the road uh, to the travel lanes before and this was converted to a um, protected facility that um, had advantages and disadvantages and it's not as comfortable um, for those sports cyclists to utilize the new facility. We're hearing more about the, about the facility from them. Uh, obviously, uh, they tend to highlight the disadvantages and the issues that um, has happened with the facility. Um, what I can tell you based on my experience uh, being out there more than tens of times these past few weeks that the facility has been very successful um, with bringing in new users. The, the main goal of achieving uh, more ridership, more bicycle riders on our coastline on this new facility uh, the, the goal was met. I, I can guarantee, I mean, if you go out there, you'll see hundreds of people that just by the look of their bikes, by the look of what they're wearing, how they're riding there, you can, you can be sure that they were not present there before. So that, that I consider a success. With regards to um, the collisions that uh, I'm sure you've seen um, on Nextdoor, on, on Facebook, in other, in other social uh, network um, platforms I can I can tell you this the situation is not as bad as it's presented uh, though the last time I checked and it was officially checked with our sheriff's office there were four recorded collisions there on that stretch and three of those were had happened when these wheel stops were not painted and unfortunately um when they were not painted, bicycles were still using the facility. And one of them I personally observed. I was standing right there when one of the three happened. Um, the bicyclists, uh, unfortunately, could not see um, the wheel stops because they were black and they were on a fresh new slurry seal that was black. So they were very hard to notice. And although the contractor had put orange cones around them, um, it was, it was uh, I guess, possible that a bicyclist would just miss them and hit them. So those were three, and there was one that l happened later on, which is a long story. Uh, but um, in short, that collision happened uh, when a bicyclist decided to, instead of going into the bikeway, into the cycle track, going southbound on South Coast 101, right at Chesterfield, uh, last second changed his mind and decided to not go into the cycle track and when tried to get out of the cycle track on uh, last second um, his handlebar hits one of the bollards um, now again we're not here to really blame the rider or the bicyclist and say like it was it was just a mis simple mistake or anything but the situation is not as dire as it's as it's presented by um, the folks who, from um, you know the origin of the project when it was designed, expressed concerns about it. Um, there are other collisions. There are other well, not collisions, other situations. Um, let's say a pedestrian was walking and the pedestrian tripped um, over one of these 
wheel stops because the pedestrian decided to basically jaywalk a couple hundred feet away from the, from the Chesterfield crosswalk. Now, do we have to count that toward the cycle track project? I can tell you one of the 12 that you see on, on the social media posts is that one. Or another one is where a bicyclist is riding northbound and there is a edge to the asphalt on the cycle track that has always been there uh, right by the bridge and the cyclist loses control because of hitting that lip in the, in the asphalt and falls down. Again, all these are unfortunate events and sad, but again, do we have to be concerned about the design of the project or these are just things that happen, have been happening? Many of these collisions, as you know, are never recorded. Our bicyclist community was never in the habit of recording all these minor accidents slash collisions that have been happening in this stretch. But now there is a group that is actively uh, looking for these type of um, accidents and recording them. Um, again, I personally don't feel there is anything wrong with the, with the safety and with the design. There are compromises that we had foreseen. We had anticipated all these um, impacts, all these pedestrians being in there. That's why at the council meeting, at the commission meeting, we did talk about the possibility of educating people, the possibility of adding signs, the possibility of even using sheriff's office uh, for educating people. Even we went as far as considering enforcement uh, we do have signs out there that clarifies for pedestrians which areas they have to use, what they can use, which areas they're not supposed to use. So um, I just want to let you know that the project is active. It's functioning. It has met its main goal of attracting more bikers, families, kids, toddlers. You, 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 you see a lot of them if you go out there. Uh, but at the same time, the compromise was more delays for sports cyclists if they want to use the facility. Many times they would have to slow down. Maybe they have to come to a complete stop when there is a surfer getting out of their car, when there's somebody that has a cool box with them. They're putting down their cool boxes and they have like three kids that they want to pass the bikeway into the, into the beach. So there are, th these are all the situations that are happening. These are, these are inevitable and we knowingly accepted this compromise when we accepted this design and when council voted for this design. Uh, with that being said, I'd rather not go uh, and cover the next five uh, and, and, and I'd like to hear from, from the commissioners if there are any questions on this specific one. I don't want to go, you know, five projects and talk about five other projects and then come back to this. So Chair, if there is any questions from the commissioners on this specific topic, I, I'd be glad to answer. Commissioners, go ahead. I have a question. Um, I'm certainly not a sports cyclist, um, and yet I am very fearful of going into that bike cycle track at all because it is it has really become a multi-use walk and and pedestrian walkway. And what would it take to remove those wheel stops so that if I'm in that cycle track and a lot of people are walking and I am now going three miles an hour and I decide to pull in, pull out and go into the Sharrow, is that a possibility? Um, good question, uh, Commissioner. Uh, first, uh, this situation with the pedestrian being in the bikeway um, has been happening. Before the wheel stops, we had the same joggers, runners in the bikeway and our sports cyclist would meander, basically would get out of the bikeway, uh, get into the travel lane and get back into the bikeway after these, um, I don't know, reverse riding or joggers running backwards, not running backwards, but in the opposite direction. Uh, this has been happening. Uh, the new thing is that we've added these wheel stops and there is a gap in between them that meets the standards with regards to the available spacing if, they, if a bicyclist with an average speed of, I, I believe the calculation was based on 12 or 15 or something, on an average a speed of 15, if they want to get out, the gap in between the wheel stops is enough for a bicyclist to navigate their way through them. Now, this is not something that I, uh, as, as one of the, you know, as, as the person in charge of the design would encourage. However, it's totally feasible. It's legal per the national standards, per the state standards. 
you are authorized to get out of a class four bicycle bikeway into a Shero. So there is nothing wrong with that. The to your other question about removing these, that's a, this is a council approved project. Um, obviously, it has to go go to back go back to council to remove. There has been conversations about the possibility of removing a few of these, but that option doesn't even have the support of the sports cyclists um, because the the main concern is if you have more and more of these big openings, then there might be abrupt uh, you know changes in the pattern and drivers in vehicles in the number two lane would have to expect a bicyclist coming out of a bikeway at a high speed at like 20 different locations along the stretch. At the moment, it cannot happen unless the bicyclist really slows down and gets out of the bikeway very slowly and very cautiously. But if we open it up, then we're talking about bicyclists getting out of that class four at a very high speed, which is really not preferred. Um, I, hope, I hope I answered all the questions. Yeah, who else? Charlie here. Uh, has there been any thought towards restricting the usage of the bike lane for uh, low speed cyclists and encouraging or maybe even requiring high speed sport cyclists to use the road itself? Um, this has been discussed. Uh, there is no standard at the moment that talks about how you separate um, a cycle track uh, for for a specific group of users that are uh, that have a uh, lower speed per se. Uh, my personal concern is that we do have a lot of sports cyclists that use the facility, and I would say 80 percent, 90 percent of the times during the day, our sports cyclists comfortably use the facility. Many of them I see they're riding pretty fast and they're very comfortable. And if we lower the speed there, we're taking away this advantage of safety from them and we're forcing them to ride in the middle of a travel lane. Now we do have many folks who don't like to ride in that, uh, in their opinion, constrained situation. Um, they can obviously use the shadow, but to post a sign and say, like, if you're riding 10 mile, more than 10 miles an hour or 12 miles an hour, you're not supposed to be in here. I think we're taking away um, an advantage from, from many of our sports cyclists that are riding there right now. Good point. Anybody else? Uh, so, no, uh, Ed, Ed, you're saying that you, uh, you do plan to get out there and uh, sort of take stock of who's using which side, because I have heard from several different people um, that people will use the northbound facility in a way that they don't use the southbound facility. And I think, um, you know, anecdotally, I've seen the same thing that you're saying, uh, that there are probably a lot of new beach cruisers uh, using both sides of the cycle track uh, on, that, on that piece of highway where they wouldn't uh, have been before. I think it'd be really helpful to have, uh, you know, numbers. You, you said you are planning on doing that? Correct, yes. Okay. I you think that's a great idea. Mind? Abe, have you already picked a date? Um, not yet. Uh, to be honest, I'll, we just had our, our parking lane open over there, and the beach is, I think, just opened last week. So I had to wait for basically the whole thing to be fully operational to have a good count. I think the restaurants are back open now, so I think everything is back. I, I got to check, but I think everything is back open now. Does anybody else have a question for you? Uh, uh, Commissioner Von Neumann, I have a comment. Um, I think in all, of the, in all of the discussion about um, the incidences, the crashes and everything that are happening in this, I, I hear often uh, saying that the people who are bringing this to people's attention and talking about it are sports cyclists who are unhappy with having something taken away. And I don't know if that's necessarily true. I'm not real comfortable with using that terminology, like classifying different riders as different things. I think the people who have concerns about the design and the functionality of the, uh, uh, of the, of the new uh, infrastructure should be respected as just cyclists. 
who have an interest in the safety for all people who might be using that. And I, and I, and I, I have difficulty and I'm uncomfortable when people start segmenting and labeling different types of cyclists. Um, I, I'm an experienced cyclist. Yeah, you call me that. I would not call myself a sports cyclist or anything like that. But even even that, you know, I don't. I wouldn't know what to classify myself. So I think you know, going forward, I think it'd be very beneficial if we just call them cyclists and rather than segmenting them. And and appreciate the fact that there are enough people who have concern for other people's safety that they're willing to come out and say things. And it may be a large group, it may be a small group. But it is a vocal group, and I think they, it, those those people and those comments need to be respected just as much as what Barry Lou was saying. Also, that's my comment. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I have one comment, or actually a question. Abe, uh, on social media, there have been a lot of I don't want to call them threats, but saying we, we're going to sue the city. Uh, have you heard from council, anybody on council at all, that they are concerned that we've created a dangerous situation? Well, that's a that's a hard question to answer, Chair. Um, yeah, council usually refers to staff to be comfortable with going forward with the design, and um, that assurance was my responsibility to give, which I gave when we designed this project. Now, if a project, this, this is a conversation that um, is really beyond engineering capacities of myself and, and my group. If a, if a project meets the design standards, meets the minimums, well, in this project, we're, we're even above minimums on almost every feature even. However, due to various factors, the compromise that came with the project can cause other safety concerns that were all well known but accepted. Now these are not caused by the elements of design. If we have a surfboard in the bikeway and a bicyclist hits the surfboard and something happens to one or both of them, does that constitute a wrong, does, does that mean the design was incorrect? If we had a kid riding backwards in a correctly designed facility and that kid gets into a collision with another cyclist that was coming in the opposite direction, does that mean the city is liable because the city was warned about this before? That's a very different story that's not really engineering matter. With regards to the engineering elements of design, I'm very sure, very confident about the project. The project meets all the cycle track standards, meets the design standards. We have two, three different um, guidelines that everybody uses. This project is not really new to Encinitas. There are more than 10 similar projects in California that are very, very similar. The features are like more than 90% the same as this one. So it's not like we invented something and now we have to defend it. Yeah, our situation is a little bit different from some other areas because our corridor is very successful and has 10 times more users than similar facilities. When you have 10 times more vehicles on the road, that road can have more accidents because there are 10 times more vehicles on it. It's a similar case. We have a facility that is very successful. We have a lot of pedestrians, a lot of bicyclists. Obviously, the conflicts increase. When the conflicts increase, there is a higher chance of collision. Does that lead to a litigation against the city? Does that mean there has been any wrongdoing on the city side? Does that mean the city will win or lose any kind of a lawsuit if it happens? That's not something I can answer, Chair. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Yes, I have one other question. Okay, I, do, I do a lot of bicycling up in Northern California, and frequently where I'm biking is a multi-use area, and there are speed limits for bicycles. Has that been considered for people on bicycles? For example, in in the waterways in Mill Valley, there are several places where the maximum speed for a bicyclist is six miles an hour. Has that been considered as perhaps a way to reduce the accidents? Because I'm very concerned about the number of accidents that have happened there. Um, 
similar to what Commissioner Leishness uh, mentioned, um, we, we do have the option of um, posting speed limits. Again, how much that is uh, enforceable and how much it's easy for our sheriff's office to basically evaluate and, and enforce and the guidelines associated with setting a speed limit for a bikeway is not really well established. We can do that. Um, but as mentioned, I feel like by doing this, we're taking away a very nice, safe facility for our Oh, well, I want to I wanna be cognizant of what uh, Commissioner Van Newman mentioned. Uh, we're taking away something from our cyclists who tend to ride a bit faster uh, for 90% of the times where there is really nobody there. So if we limit that speed on that cycle track facility, um, we've got something that, again, 90% of the times can be used very comfortably, and they are using it, uh, but we're posting a sign there and they can't use it anymore. That's that's my only concern. Again, it's something that can be considered. Thank you. Well, Mrs. Hubbard has invited me to go try it with her. Maybe I shall. I've been very nervous about doing so when I read there have been a, a dozen accidents there. Thank you. Anybody else? A lot of people are, are, are at home with nothing to do except social media. Charlie, speak up a little bit. What? Okay. Speak up a little bit. It would be interesting to see how this works after the COVID goes away, if it goes away, and we, we uh, are in more normal times uh, when people aren't uh, at home with their computers so much and they're, they're doing other things instead. Does that make sense? Well, we'll just have to wait and see. You, know, it's, you can't predict what's going to happen. Yeah, but I've noticed that social media, uh, with so many people uh, at social media instead of at work, uh, it starts a, a small incident spawns a big uh, uh, tweet storm. Uh, a former city manager said uh, a few years ago, well, folks, that's Encinitas. Let's move on to the next item, pedestrian scramble. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, the pedestrian scramble at both intersections um, were implemented, um, I believe it was last week or maybe the week before. Um, interestingly, um, people have been using it. I've, I've noticed uh, several people uh, every time I've been out there utilizing the diagonal crossing. It seems like the um, education and the familiarity process that I thought would take a couple of weeks really didn't take as long as a lot of people are comfortably uh, utilizing the uh, exclusive pet phase and um, it's functioning well. I've noticed uh, a few cycles uh, during peak periods, mainly evening periods or um, uh, around noon at weekend days. We have a little bit of more congestion between uh, B and D, between Encinitas Boulevard and D, uh, mainly going southbound. So there might be some uh, signal timing adjustments and some tweaks needed with um, the minimum greens and the pet walk times, and maybe we can make it a little bit more uh, efficient and uh, basically minimize the delay as much as possible. However, I have not had really uh, that many um, complaints from public with regards to the extra delay. We have had some uh, extra seconds of delay on average. If you recall, when we presented the model associated with this project, we did anticipate some extra delay imposed to the vehicular activity, uh, which is happening, obviously. However, um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not really that bad. I've, I've been there several times, and the traffic is flowing, and the timing is working again uh, I'm sure um, when the traffic is back to its uh, usual um, patterns we'll be able to go back revisit and do a few uh, minor signal timing adjustments to make it as efficient as possible but it's up and running 
Number three, um, I don't know, Chair, do you want me to go to the end and stop for questions or do like the first one? Uh, let's do it one at a time. Okay. Question. Anybody have any questions on number two? Uh, Commissioner Von Neumann, uh, thank you for getting those uh, going and up and running. Uh, at one point, we thought it might be the end of June. So having them done at the beginning of June, I think is great. Um, I think uh, the congestion is in autos. I think it's safer for pedestrians and people who are walking. So I think it's a, 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 a positive effect for, for our city at this time. I agree with that. Uh, this is uh, Commissioner Johnson. Uh, I looked at the scrambles and watched them in operation and uh, they, they work, they work in other cities and I, I think they're a good thing. Okay, anybody else? Okay, Commissioner Cole, I, I have a question for you, Abe. When you were out there several times, have you noticed at all if people uh, are too lazy to push a button and just start walking? Um, meaning during the red or? Yeah, just start the walk. Well, I, I think, um... I think I've noticed it once or twice. Um, people, based, based on habit, usually they assume if the parallel vehicle or movement has its green, they should be able to walk at the same time parallel to those vehicles. That's what, you know, we've learned and we've always been doing at, like, every intersection. So sometimes they feel, I guess, that, well, maybe the signal is malfunctioning, and okay, these cars have their green and going southbound 101. Why can't I go, you know, cross D and go southbound or northbound on the sidewalk? So I guess that's that's the feeling. They maybe miss the signs and and maybe they just decide to ignore. I I would I would give it some time. I'm pretty sure within a few weeks it will get better and we'll have less and less of these. Um, well, they're they're violations, but again, at the moment I won't really call them. Uh, intentional violations they could be like honest mistakes they might feel our pet head is not functioning properly uh, but we do have signs out there and uh, we posted some educational material on our on our newsletter and on the city site um, on the social social media channels of the city uh, there has been some laminated guidelines on how the scramble crossing operates installed at every pole Again, if pedestrians get a chance to see them and read them, we try to really have that not that many words on them, uh, but it does illustrate how, how the scramble works and how they're supposed to wait for their exclusive phase. Every pole, every, every one of those eight poles at those two intersections has one of those laminated guidelines on pedestrian scramble. But it did happen, I noticed, once or twice. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, let's go to item number three. Um, South Coast 101 and G Street, uh, that's a decorative crosswalk that council voted for um, late 2018. Uh, we had multiple rounds of back and forth with um, uh, E101. Um, finally came with a decorative uh, crossing design that uh, engineering our, and our risk management team was comfortable with. Um, the design is finalized, and um, our tentative date for implementation is June 16th at the moment. There, I, I believe at some point, a couple of months back, I did bring this to the commission. I just wanted to update you that this is happening. Um, there will be a small median um, in the two-way left turn lane built uh, right at G Street at the north leg um, at G Street, and there will be a crosswalk that would have a refuge area in that median island. Uh, and the whole crosswalk, um, I believe it's like 60 or 75 feet or something, um, that whole crosswalk will be painted uh, instead of white bars with white surfboards. And uh, there will be rectangular flashing beacons in both directions and in the median, and there will be ADA curb ramps built on both sides. Um, that, that's also a project that council has approved. Any questions? If not, let's go to item number four. Um, 
traffic engineering uh, pamphlets, we uh, created a few uh, pamphlets that we're uh, planning on distributing. I wanted to let you know that um, starting next week, we'll have these available for public if you want to send something. Uh, the four topics that right now we have made pamphlets for, one is our speed cushion program, one is the speed limit citywide, um, one is the uh, stop sign implementation and how it's implemented, and the fourth one is, I don't remember. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have my notes on me. Uh, but we have four of these pamphlets talking about the topics that we receive more questions from public on. Uh, they talk about how the city operates, let's say, how do we install stop signs at an intersection? Uh, how does a speed limit at a, on a roadway uh, chosen? So these will provide education. Oh, I, I think the, the next one is about the uh, different classifications of bike lanes and how bicyclists operate. Uh, so these four pamphlets, we have them available. I wanted to talk to commission to see if they have any specific uh, suggestion about a new topic that they think we have to uh, have education material for public uh, or if there is anything uh, uh, specifically that they want in those um, pamphlets for these four topics. Um, if I mean, it doesn't need to be now, just uh, I wanted to I wanted you to be aware. I can ask Amanda to send the commissioners the pamphlets and uh, take a look at them if you're interested and give us your comments. And if there is any specific topic that we we didn't think about that you think would be a good idea for a traffic pamphlet, please let us know. Okay, any comments? Yeah, Commissioner Von Neumann here. Yeah, I would love to get copies if Amanda can mail me copies of those. And I have one suggestion uh, for another pamphlet. Maybe uh, how, to, how to utilize the uh, new South Coast Highway infrastructure down in Cardiff. Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, item number five. Um, Rancho Santa Fe travel time analysis. This is, um, um, as you recall, a... Uh, project funded by city council a fifty thousand dollar study um, going over um, the current travel time uh, in rancho santa fe uh, north of encinitas boulevard uh, that evaluates the intersection controls that we have currently out there the stop signs um, there are i believe uh, between the uh, the signal at NCS Boulevard and the one um, I think is Calle at Kervo, if I'm pronouncing correctly. Um, between the suits, the two signals, we have seven stop signs, um, and the consultant is evaluating different intersection control options at these different intersections. Uh, signals, um, just removal and elimination of those stop signs, converting them to two-way stop controls neighborhood circles slash roundabouts. So based on the efficiency and the improvement associated with those changes, uh, those potential changes, the consultant is coming up with um, different scenarios. Now, nothing is set in stone. I'm not sure if you've seen emails or heard rumors uh, that the city is changing things and building a signal and building a roundabout. Uh, at the moment, there's nothing final. We are just studying the corridor and analyzing it to find out how different changes on the control of the intersections in the corridor would affect travel time. The consultant is coming up um, with different scenarios and on each one of those scenarios, we will show that if we convert this intersection from an always stop control to two way stop control, this is the anticipated improvement in travel time. If we convert this always stop to a traffic signal, this is the anticipated improvement. And then we'll have uh, one or two or three, or depending on how we want to approach it, community meeting will present these different scenarios to public, we'll receive input, and then we'll go from there. Even if there is consensus among um, the neighborhood about which one of those scenarios, which very well might be the do nothing scenario, if there is consensus among the neighborhood that that one of the scenarios is preferred, at that point even, we don't have a project because council only funded this study. At the moment, I'll, I'll get there when we talk about uh, the next item, uh, we, we have a little bit of limitations with our, with our funding. So it's not like if, if the study shows that there is a very um, 
very a project with a very good potential, we can just go ahead and do it if the neighborhood likes it. No, we have to go secure funding. We have to uh, evaluate how we want to spend money on this corridor because uh, I'm sure you know a, a signal uh, which very well might be might be the best answer at at Lone Jack or or at um, El Camino del Norte um, would easily cost the city around two to three hundred thousand uh, dollars, which is at the moment we don't have any any funding associated with that with that potential signal. Again, I want to reiterate that there is nothing really final. There is there is no project. It's just a study at the moment with more than eight nine different scenarios uh, being evaluated parallel to each other to be able to present to public how changes in the intersection controls along the stretch would impact the travel time during AM and PM peak. Um, they're almost done. Our next step would be to meet with um, basically the residents of, of the neighborhood. Any comments? Commissioner Lushman, this is a question. Is the uh, commission study taking into consideration the proposed commercial development directly behind the 7-Eleven uh, there at the intersection of San Fe and Rancho San Fe and Encinitas, which is a great concern for a lot of people and can potentially skew the uh, usage model tremendously based on whether or not uh, that proposed development occurs. So that is my question. Well, um... I, I'd be a little bit hesitant uh, about uh, going deep into the impact of that project because it hasn't been um, the traffic study for that project is not is not finished yet. Uh, we're still in conversation with the developer with regards to the scope of the project. Uh, there are um, a lot of different uh, complications. Uh, the project being a uh, by right project and technically CEQA exempt. There are, there, are, there are concerns about how we can assure that we are capturing and we are evaluating all the potential impacts of this project um, to meet our general plan goals and guidelines. Um, however, um, at the moment at least, this project does not have a access to Rancho Santa Fe. There is an access on Rancho Santa Fe behind uh, the 7-Eleven. However, that one's an emergency access only. Now, the only potential um, impact on Rancho Santa Fe would be if people during AM and PM peak would somehow decide to get out, get out, get out of their driveway on Encinitas Boulevard, um, turn left, go toward the Encinitas Boulevard and Rancho Santa Fe signal, and then turn left again onto Rancho Santa Fe. They have to make two left turns at, uh, well, the first driveway, I'm not even sure if it can work without a signal. That has to be studied. But, but at the moment, let's just assume it's not signalized. At their driveway, they have to make a lift, which is not an easy lift, crossing three lanes of traffic over there at NCNS Boulevard, uh, go toward the signal at Santa Fe, and then making a lift again onto Rancho Santa Fe and going north. Um, the fact that Rancho Santa Fe is carrying, I think, around 15,000 vehicles at the moment, I don't anticipate that impact to be really huge and really affecting our study. Um, that project, I think, is having 200 and some units. Uh, 200 and some units uh, would be um, approximately the same amount during peak period. So we're talking about around, let's say, 300 vehicle trips during AM peak. And let, if 80% if of them are even in, we're looking at 200, 250 trips coming out of the project. Uh, that 250, how much of it finds its way into Rancho Santa Fe? I doubt that it would be that big that, that we should be concerned about redoing our analysis just because of a portion of that 250 that is coming out of the project during AM peak and going northbound Rancho Santa Fe. Well, I, I'm glad you've given it some thought. My uh, only input is there will be a lot of people who uh, are suspect of the study unless that issue is addressed. Uh, it is a, a real point of contention for people in that area and that they maintain that the development definitely will impact the traffic flow. And so if the analysis does not consider the impact of that development, it will really, uh, you will get a, a, a lot of people who question the validity of it. So based on your answer, I'm glad you're considering it. I'll just you know, give you a heads up. 
this is a, a big issue associated with the analysis of that corridor. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, we're, we're fully aware, and again, we're doing our best to assure we're, we're capturing and we're analyzing every, every aspect, every, every potential impact of the project. However, because of the complications with how this project was, you know, in our, in our housing element and it's a buy right project, there are concerns and there are complications with regards to what we can ask and what, how, we, how, we're, how we're supposed to ask for those. We're working with the developer to make sure we're, we're conducting a full comprehensive analysis. Good answer. Anybody else? Uh, Commissioner Cole, I can tell you, Abe, I'm getting a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails on, the, on, the, on that uh, study, and it's amazing the rumors are floating around of that we're going to be putting all these traffic signals in. I just tried to tell them exactly what you said. This is a study. We, there will, once that is done, sure there will be ex public meetings to discuss the study. And as you said, there is really no money, even though we might, the consultant might come up with some good plans. But I, I'm just kind of blown away the rumors that are going around what's going to happen. So. Okay, let's go to item number six. Um, yes, uh, so Volcan and La Costa, um, the, the signal design is still ongoing. Um, it will progress and at some point I anticipate having a 90% plan that I can bring to commission and present. Um, however, um, as, as mentioned when I was talking about the previous item, uh, because of various reasons, we have had some um, fiscal constraint that uh, during at least the next fiscal year, we had to cut um, a few of our um, of our fundings uh, in our in some of our some of our accounts. So we had to drop a few projects from our uh, nice to have and good to have list of projects. Um, one was this one. So at the moment, uh, we don't have this project. We did have a set aside of around 250 or 300 k, um, but uh, at the moment we don't have this for next next fiscal year. Uh, maybe after the project design is finalized, we can revisit this and have uh, have it added to our uh, list of funded projects for the 2021-2022 um, fiscal year. But from 2020-2021 fiscal year, this project was um, defunded. Uh, but again, the design is ongoing, uh, and I anticipate within the next month or two, I'll be able to bring the full design to the commission. Any comments? One comment. Yes, we definitely need to get some, some way to get from Vulcan to La Costa Avenue. That's a major problem for me every day. Um, is it possible that in the very near future you could change La Costa Avenue from its designation as a four lane road down to a two lane road? I'm very concerned about the impact, particularly of that huge hotel that is going in. Um, well, this this was discussed, uh, I believe, a couple months back here. Uh, the designation, the classification of a roadway on our circulation element is not something that traffic engineering um, makes a decision on. Or, or well, obviously, we are consultant and, and consulted, and and we do get involved and provide our input and feedback. But the circulation element update is a process that the planning um, division undertakes. Um, after the housing element was handled last year, um, there is a study uh, called the circulation element update that needs to be started. Our planning division, I'm not sure if it was funded for this year, I have to go look, but I, I do believe it was one of the projects that was supposed to be funded. When that project starts, that's when um, a lot of different uh, modelings and analyses come into play with regards to how the roadway should be classified. At the moment, with our very old circulation element um, plan, which I believe goes back 20 years or something, maybe even more, uh, La Costa is considered a four-lane road. Um, however, we all know that the majority of the residents want a two-lane road and don't want a four-lane road, and that's how it is right now. It's, a, it's, it's striped as a, as a one-lane each-direction road. 
So how that study would evolve and what the results of that would be and if it's to the level that uh, we can basically compromise and accept a lower level of service um, but keep it as a one-lane restriction road, that's something that I can't really say at the moment and it's not something that I as a traffic engineer or even traffic commission for that matter could really um, decide the classification or choose the classification of the road. But it will come up at some point down in a few months and obviously I will ask the consultant and the planner in charge of the study to come present the circulation element progress to commission uh, occasionally. Anybody have any questions on any of the items? Yes, Commissioner Von Niven has a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank the city for the installation of new bike lanes on Village Park Way between Encinitas Boulevard and Parkdale Lane, and actually between um, Encinitas Boulevard and all the way down to Mountain Vista. There were never bike lanes there before, but with the new slurry seal between Encinitas Boulevard and Parkdale Way, uh, bike lanes and with, with buffered, uh, buffered bike lanes were installed, and uh, the city extended the buffered bike lanes all the way down to Mountain Vista, which makes that area near Parkdale Lane School much safer for anybody who wants to bicycle that section. So kudos to the city for that. And the other question I have for Abe, is there, do you have any update on South Willow Spring Drive between Cerro and Encinitas Boulevard? Um, not yet, Commissioner. As mentioned, um, um, I'm still working on getting a better idea of how parking on that road is being utilized, being able to, to basically meet those residents, which um, considering, you know, the the type of the facility is being a senior residence. I mean, during COVID, it wasn't really easy to go out, meet, you know, them and discuss how how really they will be impacted by a bike lane. I do know commission voted for this bike lane. Um, however, um, as, as mentioned before, I've heard some concerns from the residents that was passed to city council um, that that parking is really needed. We had this other option that was uh, provided to us by commission last time about, okay, uh, what if we go a bike lane from Cerro to the clubhouse and then after we convert it to a Cerro. So we have multiple options there. Uh, the project is not really complicated and we do have the funds associated with the project. Uh, it's just I want to be I want to be sure that whatever we do um, basically we don't make it complicated for some some other folks because it's not like a super utilized facility so it's not like we have hundreds of bikes there and the, and the volume of traffic is really low so I think a shadow can work if it's a compromise we want to make I think a shadow can work there thank you thank you Ed. Uh, let's move on to item five oral communications Amanda we have any we do we have three um, three speakers Let's go ahead with those. First is Eric Von Blucher, who says, I would like to add a Belour traffic calming cushions to the agenda to follow up on requests to slow down traffic and make our streets safer. Can you please add my request as to what has been done and is being done since our inquiry last month? Thank you. Next is Diane Lance. Members of the Traffic and Public Safety Commission, I have reviewed the agenda and materials on the City of Encinitas website for tonight's Traffic and Public Safety Commission meeting. I do have a couple of questions, comments. Will street parking be eliminated on the east side of Vulcan in areas where the east side is identified as the pedestrian side? That would free up a lot of space and parking should be available on the west side of Vulcan, especially when the city completes the needed improvements. Can the fence at La Costa Avenue and Vulcan Avenue not be moved back to provide a wider pedestrian walking area? Why are the graphics showing pedestrians on the east side of Vulcan between Lucadia Boulevard and Encinitas Boulevard? What about the AC path on the west side of Vulcan? Thank you for your time. The last one is from Elena Thompson. 
Hello, traffic um, and city staff. For years now, we have been inquire inquiring and advocating for La Costa Avenue west of the I-5 to be reclassified from four lanes to two. Our request has gone unaddressed to date. The situation on La Costa Avenue is growing more problematic and unsafe by the day for local residents. We have a 200-room hotel soon to open, a 48-home development coming soon, a timeshare project and housing plan site with 50-plus units. All properties will be accessed off this road. This is on top of the current traffic volume, which is significant on an, a road, no sidewalk, and speed enforcement. We want to be sure this road does not grow in width or have added any travel lanes, which is why this letter is requesting the roadway reclassification roadway classification, excuse me, to be changed as part of the current circulation element update noted by Mr. Bandigan's May 2018 email included in this letter. What can you tell us about how we can have reclassified the current status of the roadway while the circulation element is being updated in order to ensure that our pu public safety and community character is not ruined by a potential four-lane road or road with stoplights? This is too important a road to ignore any longer. We would appreciate this commission voting in favor of this change now and to add it to the log tonight. In the meantime, we would like to see a solar speed feedback sign installed on La Costa Avenue in both directions adjacent to Sheridan Road in order to help calm travel speeds and protect public safety. Thank you for your service, Elena and John Thompson. That's it? Yes. Chair, Chair uh, Commissioner Von Neumann. I can't really uh, hear very clearly uh, Amanda's reading of the uh, uh, letters. I don't know if anybody else is having that problem or if anybody who is uh, joining from the community through the, uh, the audio feed. But I just want to let everybody know that uh, all these letters were sent to each of the traffic commissioners. And I, for one, have copies of them all. And I'm, I'm letting everybody know that I will read each and every one of those to better understand what, what they actually are. Thank you. Okay, Amanda, thank you. Amanda, you said you have them all printed. So if you sit closer to my workstation, I think it would be better. Do you want to? Yeah, we can, we can wear masks in. Well, as long as you keep social distance, if you wear masks, and then we really get bad trying to understand. <laughs> no, she can, she can sit here. Because um, I think the microphone that is being used is my war microphone. So if you, you can sit here, and after we're done with the oral communication, we can switch seats. I'm done with those for now. So oh, okay. I'll, I'll stay here for now just so that I can um, do the things I need to do. On okay, yeah, maybe next. Or, or you know what? Maybe I can just read them. Let me, let me grab them from you, and then I can read them. Well, I thought we were done. There were only three. No, no, we have more for uh, action items. Okay, but not under oral communication. No, yeah, we're done with the oral communication, yes. That's okay. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Okay, let's move on to item 7A. Six, six, Peter. There are minutes. Oh, yeah, I always forget about the minutes. Well, if uh, you had a chance to review the minutes from the last meeting. Are there any changes, additions, corrections, deletions? If not, I entertain a motion to uh, approve the minutes as written. I, will. So I have a second. Commissioner Von Neyman seconds. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, uh, motion carries seven to nothing. Now we can move on to item 7A. Thank you, Chair. Um, we have, how many Amanda? Seven? We have seven emails on this that um, Residents have requested uh, us read these. Uh, do you want me to go over my presentation first and then read these, yeah, or yeah, do? Please go over your presentation. Okay. First. 
Well, it's it's not really a presentation. This is an item that um, I wanted to present to commission, uh, basically show the plan to commission and receive input on on the design. So as, as you recall, um, after we did uh, the original South 101 project um, was, let me share my screen. Can everybody see this? You can see this, commissioners? Anybody can, anybody cannot see it. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So when, when we started designing South Coast uh, 101 project, it was from um, Swami's all the way down to Solana Beach. However, as you know, because of funding reasons, uh, we couldn't slurry the whole stretch, and we decided to basically cut it in half, almost half, and mm -hmm. do the Chesterfield to um, Solana Beach first and leave this one for a later date. Um, traffic Commission last month uh, asked us to evaluate the possibility of doing some sort of a, um, I guess, low-hanging fruit, smaller type project uh, that is feasible, considered um, our limited uh, resources available, and basically complete um, this this gap and, and, and fix this whole missing link. There is a stretch that doesn't have a bike lane and. Um, basically go all the way from K Street down. Another reason, uh, this has been brought up uh, by commission, I believe uh, Commissioner Grover at some point a couple of months back asked for this. Uh, another reason that this was uh, suggested, by, suggested by the commission was uh, because we didn't do any kind of a traffic calming project uh, on this stretch, we could not lower the speed limit on this uh, segment of 101 from K Street to Chesterfield to 35. So in downtown and also th south of Chesterfield, with the measures that we implemented with the whole lane narrowing and the cycle track and everything, we've been able to lower the speed limit. However, this segment between Chesterfield and K, uh, we couldn't. We just utilized the five mile per hour um, reduction option that the traffic engineer had. So I believe um, we lowered it to 40 mile per hour, which goes to council on Wednesday for its second reading. And immediately after, obviously, we'll uh, start changing the speed limit signs. So because of these various reasons, commission suggested we look into the possibility of doing some sort of a uh, traffic calming slash bike improvement project uh, in this stretch of road. Um, I have the design here, and I'll go uh, segment by segment. We'll go over it, and um, I'll tell you what we have done and why we have done that. Um, I'll go over some of the concerns that you'll hear about uh, when I when I read the uh, emails, and there are uh, other um, uh, other concerns that I have heard about and I have had uh, that I wanted to discuss with you to basically. Uh, make a decision on how we want to approach this and how we want to do this project, um, if we want to do this, obviously. Um, first and foremost, uh, the main goal uh, of this was to have a project that was feasible, basically to have a project, because this, is, this can go and become another South 101 project. This can go, uh, the whole road could have been um, the striping on the road could have been removed. There is a lot of potential. We have a lot of width um, that doesn't meet our um, current citywide standard, how we do things. Um, but again, that would, that would mean that we have to basically remove uh, miles and miles of existing striping from the road that is very costly and make the, make the road look really ugly. So we didn't really wanna go and remove everything both because of cost and the aesthetics concern. And uh, we wanted to go for something that was feasible and was uh, relatively easy. So because of that, um, the lines, the black lines you see on this plan are the new striping that will be added to the road, the new lines to be added to the road, and nothing else will be removed, which is a huge 
advantage when it comes to cost associated with a striping project. Now, um, the disadvantage, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse icon here. Can you see that? Yes. So this is right um, south of Swami's uh, crosswalk. As you can see, in both directions, we're adding a buffer to narrow down the lanes, the outer lanes, to 10 feet wide lanes. So the southbound one was 14 feet wide before, adjacent to an 8 feet wide um, bike lane. We're adding a 4 feet wide buffer to convert the southbound to a 10 footer. This can easily be done by adding a second line there and a couple of cross hatches to form the buffer. On the northbound side, the number two lane was only 12 feet wide. We're just taking out two feet, forming a buffer for the outer lane, but we cannot convert, we cannot change number one lane. Well, not we cannot, we decided not to because converting the number one lane to a 10 footer travel lane would have given us a four footer buffer Basically, we could have had two 10-footer lanes and a four-footer buffer, but that meant we would have to remove skip stripe all the way from uh, basically the campground, the San Alejo, the first entrance to the San Alejo Beach parking lot. So the whole skip stripe would have been removed, and we would have to redo the skip stripe uh, along the stretch. That would affect um, the cost uh, by a very big margin. Because of that, we decided not to touch this existing skip stripe and just add a line without removing anything. Um, going, so that's, uh, I just want to give you an idea that that has been uh, one of the uh, main uh, uh, factors in, in designing this uh, to basically minimize removals and minimize the cost associated with the project. Um, going further south, as you can see, it's relatively similar. We're converting all the outer lanes to 10 feet wide lanes and forming buffers. We're going, uh, this is where we have, uh, where we're getting close to the guardrail. This is, this is where the guardrail, where, where my um, mouse icon is, where the guardrail picks up. So we're having a relatively wide buffer, a four-footer buffer, and a two-footer buffer, which is almost the minimum for northbound. The lanes are going down to 10 feet. The center stripes median is not touched in any way. That again is a huge uh, impact. Those things are very wide. The double yellow lines, each one is around two feet wide to remove and basically water blast those two two footer wide double yellow lines is a huge cost. Um, again, if we remove that, we could have had a different facility. We could have had a wider buffer. We could have cl made the lanes closer to each other, caused more friction, uh, better impact for traffic calming. Uh, but then again, as you can see, as I move further down, we're not touching the stripe median. The lanes are becoming 10 feet. Uh, we're, we're forming a buffer as much as we can. The way we formed the buffer was basically as simple as choosing a 10-footer lane and whatever extra width we have uh, we formed a buffer with that. So this goes all the way down until here where uh, South 101 starts to widen up, basically where the guardrail um, ends. This is where we have um, a lot of uh, comments and input from, um, again, I guess I have to say for the record, from our um, sports cyclists from our more professional, I, I don't know how to put it, just chair advice on how, how, do, I, how do I be cognizant of what Commissioner Van Neumann mentioned, what, how do I say this, uh, from, the, from the group who are more professional, avid cyclists. Um, this area, we, this is where currently the bike, ways, the bike lane stops, where my, where my uh, mouse icon right now is for southbound. I, I don't know if on your screen you can see the white line stop. That white line is the existing end point of the bike lane for southbound. What we did, we took the bike lane and continued it all the way. Now the southbound is getting wider and wider to form two travel lanes here. That's where our concrete median is picking up now. Um, this is where the parking so 
This is where the second lane opens up. Now from the 20 feet one lane, we're going to two 10 feet um, wide lanes. And this is where parking picks up for the first time going southbound. Now this is, this is the tricky part. In this area, we only have 32 feet of width. And that's really pushing it to the edge where we're counting on, uh, I don't know, the real, real edge of the road where it might not be really counted as edge, but we're counting on it to, to basically have that 32. So we have that 32. The 10 feet is obviously the minimum we can have for travel lanes. So the only option to have a bike lane and basically continue our bike lane all the way toward Chesterfield was to convert it to a seven feet parking lane and a five feet bike lane. Now, I wanna be really clear, this does meet the standard. This is not liked by many of the avid bicyclists. Many, I'm, I'm, I'm saying many because this is all over the region, all over the country. This is an MUTCD, this is an NACTO. This is a very accepted standard. To have a bike lane adjacent to a parking lane, there are hundreds if not thousands of examples of this, but there are, there are valid concerns. Concern being if somebody opens a door into this bike lane, there are, they are uh, basically impeding they are, it can cause problems. The reason I, I chose this, the reason I felt this is a worthy compromise, this is something that I can live with, was, uh, was three. One was that, first of all, it, it does meet the standards, obviously. This is something that we're allowed to do. We have done it in our other areas of town. Um, we have it on the other side. If you, if you check the northbound side, people park by a bike lane and they open their doors in the bike lane. And that's not even a parking, that's not even an official parking lane, but it's, it has been utilized as a parking lane forever. And it's there. So we have it in other areas of town. People are familiar with it. We haven't had a door, dooring, door zone accident collision in the other areas of town. Um, again, to say it's, it's never going to happen, that's not easy to say. But... It, it is all over the place. People know it. People are familiar with it. Bicyclists are way more cautious when riding close to a car. And again, it meets the standard. Second reason was that if we don't do this, we have to convert it to a Shero. What happens is when we convert to a Shero, this situation with a 10-10-5-7 or 10-10-5-8, from the time where guardrail ends and the roadway becomes two lanes in southbound, up to Chesterfield, it's around 3,600 feet. So, but we only have this situation with 10, 10, 5, 7 or 10, 10, 5, 8, the two 10s being lanes and five being bike lane and seven or eight being a parking lane, only at around 900 feet of it. The other three-fourths, the other 75% of the stretch, we either have no parking at all or we have wider parking and wider bike lane. If you, if you look at this area, this is the entrance to the, to the parking lot. There is no bike, there's no parking lane here. But if I convert that small stretch, that's like 500 feet. I can't have a shallow bike lane, shallow again, bike lane for 500 feet, 1,000 feet. So there is no such a segment. We, sh we should have continuity and to have a shallow bike lane, shallow bike lane in a 4,000 feet segment is not really a good design. So I thought because of 900 feet that we have these concerns, which are, which are valid concerns, but again, this, this meets the standards and people are using it all over town, all over the region, all over the country. To eliminate the possibility of having a nice bike lane for another, um, 27, 2800 feet because we want to convert this to a share. That's, that's a compromise that I didn't like. I didn't like to eliminate the possibility of having a bike lane for southbound for this 3600 feet stretch because of the 900 feet that we have this situation with. And the third was our experience with South 101 um, in the northern areas of town. I'm sure you all remember the situation we had. If we basically 
make this an eight foot or nine foot parking area and cross hatch a door zone, this 12 feet area, the um, five feet bike lane and seven feet parking lane will become a eight footer parking lane and a four footer door zone cross hatch. Relatively similar to what we have in Northern Area Town, uh, North 101. What happens is a lot of people will confuse it with a bike lane and start riding in it. And now we're forcing people, well not forcing, we're confusing people into a non-standard, non-bike lane facility. It's a four feet cross hatch door zone that many will start utilizing as a bike lane because they don't want to stay in the lane. They don't, they don't occupy the lane. They don't feel comfortable occupying the lane. If we don't cross hatch the door zone and just leave it as a white lane, then we're not achieving our traffic calming. Um, I'm trying not to be confusing, but the, 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 the other scenario, if, if not cross hatching the door zone, would be to have an eight footer parking lane and then a 14 footer outer travel lane. That 14 footer outer, lane, outer travel lane in no way is a good outer lane for a Shero. It's a relatively fast road. We want to lower the speed limit by basically implementing traffic calming measures. We want to narrow down the lane. If we don't do the door zone, we can narrow down the lane. If we do the door zone, then we have the similar situation with North, North 101. So it's not, it's not a win-win situation per se. Between these alternatives, um, I thought the idea of having a five-footer bike lane and a seven-footer parking for 800, 900 feet and then having another nice clean bike lane all, all this for, for the whole stretch is, is a good idea. Again, not, not the best design, not the most preferred, but we have to basically play with what we have. We only have 32 feet of width and there's no way uh, we can narrow that median. Now, obviously, if there was a bigger project in play that we could redo the whole road, that was a different story. But to connect um, Swamis to the newly constructed project south of Chesterfield, this, in my opinion, is a project that can work. The northbound, again, is easier. We have a five-foot existing bike lane. We're just narrowing down the outer lane to 10 feet. So all the lanes are basically going to 10 feet um, by the entrance to the um, beach parking lot, we have a um, bike lane adjacent to it. I didn't uh, change the bike lane that much, um, but the adjacent width is not parking, so bikers can easily get out of it. I didn't want to play with the cross section as much to keep, to keep it simple. Um, this is a merge area that I most probably go with some sort of a more a clarified delineation. This is where cars coming out of the parking lot would have to uh, basically change lane and go into the uh, number two lane. And uh, we have, again, this situation in many areas of town. Um, similar case. Well, not, not exactly similar, but northbound one, 101 going into Chesterfield. We have something like this right now. And this is where we get close to um, Chesterfield signal southbound that has a similar case. We again have parking adjacent to the curb and we have an eight footer parking lane and a five footer bike lane. Uh, that goes all the way to Chesterfield. Uh, northbound Chesterfield, the aerial we had was before the Sandak project that shows the free ride. Obviously we don't have it now. It's a controlled ride at the moment, but the bike lane is the same. We have a bike lane there and we will be adding a buffer uh, again, if, if this project goes through, we'll be adding a buffer adjacent to the bike lane for northbound. This, again, this free ride does not exist right now, but the rest is the same. Um, parking lane on the southbound, a five feet bike lane adjacent to it, and two 10 footer uh, wide travel lanes. So I hope um, I hope I was clear enough. Um, again, the, the biggest uh, concern that I've received from our um, uh, experienced cyclists, uh, sports cyclists groups were uh, the fact that when somebody's um, riding in a bike lane adjacent to a car, uh, there is a higher chance of obviously being doored. Um, and um, 
there are studies that show um, that these uh, basically during collisions do count for around 15 to 20 percent, I believe, of all bicycle collisions. Now, it's not like they increase collisions, but out of the out of all the collisions reported for um, bicycles, around 15 to 20 percent are associated with collisions uh, for bicycles being doored. I, I, I think the highest is for right hook when bicyclists are uh, caught when a vehicle turns right, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, this also is a portion of the collisions. Um, I think I covered everything that I wanted to talk about. Uh, I'm, I'm open to questions and comments, Chair. Can you first read the uh, correspondence on that, and then we'll sure, the commissioners to read? Sure. Um, this is from uh, gentleman John Elden. Uh, hello, traffic commissioners. As an experienced, well over 100,000 cumulative miles and competent road bicyclist, I adamantly oppose the striping of a door zone class 2 bike lane on Highway 101 between K Street and Chesterfield. An essential part of defensive bicyclist, bicycling is to avoid the door zone, not only for the obvious reason of not wanting to win the dreaded door prize, but also because of other dangers this, praxi, this practice exacerbates. Drivers suddenly emerging from between parked cars to access the driver's door of their parked vehicle are much more likely to collide with a door zone cyclist than with one further from the curb. In addition, passing motorists will often try to squeeze the cyclist between a rock parked vehicle, in parentheses, and a hard place moving vehicle, in parentheses. Worst of all, DZLBs create the false expectation from motorists, parentheses, and too many law enforcement officers that cyclists have no right to use their lane or to inconvenience them. Absent the lane reduction, the safest treatment of this stretch of road is a reduction in the speed limit. 35 mile per hour was obviously an improvement over 40, but 30 would be far better. Given the high volume of bicycling, pedestrian, and vehicle parking slash unparking activity, coupled with very prominent shadows and bikes may use full lane signage. Please listen to the cycling community for a change. We know what we're doing, and we're ready and willing to share our extensive expertise. Thank you for reading, John. Um, this one is from Frank Lenners. I apologize in advance if I'm reading the names incorrectly. Um, good evening, Traffic Commission. My name is Frank Lenners. I am both an avid bicyclist and also someone who is very familiar with during collisions. Over the years, I compiled and mapped during crashes in California, critiqued the insidious so-called standards, and contributed to a global database which tracks during fatalities. This comment is in regards to item 7A, restriping of South Coast Highway 101 between K Street and Chesterfield Drive, particularly the portion where a new five feet bike lane is proposed to be installed next to a seven feet parking lane. Riding in or near the door zone, whether there is a marked bicycle lane or not can cause serious injuries or even death. This fact is true at a slower speeds as well. Victims of these insidious so-called minimum standards have been severely injured or killed from one of the following collisions. One, a direct strike to the vehicle door. Open doors range between three feet and five feet wide when opened. The victim rides outside the strike zone. Oh, this is number two. Two, vic the victim rides outside the strike zone, but is still close enough to where his or her handlebar catches on the edge of the door they are thrown out the opposite direction, often into the adjacent traffic lane. This is what happened to Lenny Trin in 2018 when he was killed while riding in a five feet wide bike lane next to a seven feet wide parking lane in Burbank. Three, the victim sees the opening car door but swerves instinctively in the opposite direction, not having had time to check for traffic to their left. This is what happened to Bennett 
Singh, who was killed while riding a Ford, a Ford Go bike in San Francisco last year. He strove to avoid an ongoing car door and was run over by a large truck. There are places where bicycle lanes may be an appropriate treatment, but never in a door zone. The appropriate treatment in these areas where a sufficient door zone buffer cannot be provided to discourage cyclists from riding in or near the door zone is to place shared lane marking and BMUFL signs in the center of number two, AKA slow lane. Bicycles should not be misled by poor engineering standards, which demands they operate in a well-known hazardous area. If possible, please project the image for the commission to see and study in person. Uh, this image, Amanda, I don't have. If you have, oh, you don't have it either? Okay. Um, third one from Serge Isakov. Isakov. Um, I'm pleased to see, uh, dear commissioners and Mr. Bandigan, I'm pleased to see another earnest attempt by the city of Encinitas to enhance the quality of bicycling and make it more inviting for all to enjoy the activity. Narrowing and moving the traffic lanes to make room for buffers is a terrific improvement. However, the door zone bike lanes that are part of the, this project will create conflicts, hazards where none exist today. Hazards that will cause tragedies. Given the stated constraints of the project, the best solution where there is parking is to apply shadows in those areas. Open car doors typically extend three to three and a half feet from the side of a car. Bicyclists are about two feet wide elbow to elbow. It's physically impossible to ride fully within a five foot back lane and be outside of the door zone. Three and a half feet for the open door plus two feet of cyclists equ equ equals five and a half, which is greater than five. And that's with zero space between the bicyclists, be between the cyclists and door edge. Even a bicyclist, even if a bicyclist is riding on the bike lane stripe, halfway out of the bike lane, their shoulder is still only four feet from the parked cars, well within the startle zone. When a door suddenly opens, extending three and a half feet out, the cyclist riding on the bike lane stripe will have their arm a mere six inches from the edge of the door and is likely to flinch reflexively, swerving away from the threat, perhaps into the path of an overtaking vehicle. This is a fairly common and tragic cause of bicyclist fatalities. It is unconscionable to put people on bikes in such a situation, especially by a city that purports to be bike friendly. It is also physically impossible for an eight foot wide bus or RV in a 10 foot lane to legally pass a two foot wide bicyclist riding at the edge of the bike lane. Even if we ignore mirrors and assume the eight foot wide vehicle is all the way left within the 10 foot lane, that, that leaves only two feet to the cyclist in the bike lane. This design leaves the cyclist with only two legal choices, risk doing or risk side swipes. And the vehicle drivers with no way to legally pass a cyclist riding in the bike lane outside of a door zone. Finally, currently cyclists are able to ride safely and comfortably well away from the dangerous parked cars, but with the bike lane legally requiring them to ride in the door zone or a startle zone, those who choose to ride a safe distance from the hazards outside of a bike lane will be subject to harassment by motorists and law enforcement. Uh, Judy Frankel, to whom it may concern, please read this, read the letter below out loud at June 8th City of Encinitas Traffic and Public Safety Commission meeting regarding item 7A. Dear commissioners, it is great that the city is following along the recommendation to narrow travel lanes and widen bike lanes when making road changes and for the existing bike lanes in this section that is a good idea. Narrowing travel lanes is a traffic calming measure. The traffic commission is also already very familiar with the dangers of trying to shoehorn a minimum five feet width bike lane between parked cars and the travel lane. This was already determined not to be a safe option in Lucadia. The commission voted to wait for a street escape and do it right. It is even more dangerous in this segment as the speed limit is higher and bike speeds are also higher on this descent. 
Um, the parking is even busier. So not only is there a danger of being doored while moving at high speed, but pedestrians will move out from between parked cars into the bike lane to access their cars. There is not enough space for motorists to legally pass cyclists in this space within the adjoining travel lane and give three foot of safe passing distance. NCS should make it a policy not to ever add door zone bike lanes and especially in highly trafficked areas. The minimum width of a bike lane where speeds are over 40 miles per hour according to California Highway Design Manual should be six feet and NCS should be going beyond minimum requirements. Having city policies that are best practices will help those that bike and walk to feel confident that the city has their safety always at heart and they will not have to return to the same issue every time a street is being changed. Please add shares to the number two lane where no bike lane currently exists until such time as the road can be reconfigured to add safe bike lanes that are not in the door zone of cars. You could also consider removing parking to fit a bike lane. Thank you. Um, Renee Robinson, please read the letter below out loud at June 8th, City of Encinitas Traffic and Public Safety Commission. Dear Commissioners, I'm Mr. Bandigan. I'm pleased to see that the City of Encinitas is wanting to enhance the quality of bicycling and make it more inviting for all to enjoy safely. However, the proposed plan of adding the door zone bike lanes between Swamis and Chesterfield will create conflicts and increase safety hazards where none exist today. Given the stated limitations of the project, the best solution is to add shares in those areas adjacent to parking until more resources are available for an improved streetscaping plan. Though the proposed plan falls into the minimum traffic standards, there is increasing evidence that research that during crashes account for 12 to 27 percent of bicycle vehicle collisions with many of those ending in tragic consequences. The narrowing of the bike lane to five feet adjacent to a seven feet parking lane was even acknowledged in your agenda report as not a preferable setup due to the store zone concerns. Additionally, this was already determined not to be a safe solution in Lucadia, nor will it be here. It's unconscionable to move forward with a plan that is known to be dangerous when there is an alternate, safer option available, adding shares. This is why recent designs for bike lanes include a buffer to account for the door zone to minimize risk until traffic standards are updated to include this requirement. Adding, the risk, adding to the risk in this area is the highly active parking area adjacent to the proposed bike lane and the increased speed of cyclists on this downhill section. Given all these factors, the current door zone bike lane plan is not worth the increased risk of injury to residents and users of this area. Please use shadows at the areas adjacent to the parking to minimize the known dooring hazard. The shadows add to a continuous design from Lucadia to the shadows south of Chesterfield that flow into Solana Beach. Thank you for your consideration. Is that it? No, two more, Chair. Okay. Um, this one from Alina Thompson. Good evening. As a former co-chair of Blackwalk and Sinidas, I want to let you know that for seven years, Blackwalk and Sinidas has been advocating for a safer Highway 101 for the benefit of all users, vehicles, cyclists, and pedestrians. After all, our Highway 101 is the crown jewel of Encinitas and San Diego, the world in fact, and is deserving of a safe driving, biking, and walking infrastructure. And yet today, this roadway is still highly unsafe, largely speaking, largely speaking, and without a consistent and well-planned, user-friendly and safe mobility design and function. The section being discussed tonight, item 7A, has been on the bike walk in Sinira's top 10 list for years. So I am personally very happy it is being discussed tonight. However, the plan before you is an inadequate response to the safety needs of the Cardiff roadway and should be put on hold as hard as it is to suggest having any bikeway improvement put on hold. The real truth is that this road needs a road rebalancing lane diets that is, all travel lanes narrowed, the median removed or narrowed, seven-foot bike lanes striped in and buffers included both north and southbound. Cyclists cannot be channeled next to parked cars, 
and shoehorn into a five feet bike lanes with vehicle traffic traveling at current speeds. In sum, we would urge this commission to kick back the plan and request the staff to come up with a better, safer solution. If this is not possible, perhaps the funds for this section can be instead redirected to the Lucadia Highway 101 section, restriping from A Street to Marchetta, part of the Lucadia streetscape that just got leapfrogged over due to COVID and sorely needs the striping as well. Um, this one from Steve Miche, Miche. Um, please read in public comments in reference to Traffic and Public Safety Commission item 7A. I would recommend that the Traffic Commission consider holding workshops, develop a dialogue, and consult with local bike safety advocacy groups prior to finalizing any bicycle traffic flow changes. Many of the local groups have broad range of resources and expertise related specifically to the cycling community's needs. I believe it is important that the community has a voice in public projects and that the city listens to and evaluates any logical or supported recommendations the public may make. In doing so, it could save money taxpayers, it could save many taxpayers dollars in project revision and more importantly, save lives. I ask that Traffic Commission hold on a workshop and invite the community slash barking advocate groups to participate by submitting suggestions of safe and practical options to the restriping project on South Coast Highway between K Street and Chesterfield. This could simply be done by inviting the public to submit in writing their recommendations, post them for everyone to see, and then evaluate them at the next Traffic and Public Safety Commission meeting. My personal opinion as a longtime cyclist and someone who has spent a career in public safety is that a shadow with a painted door zone be added from K Street to Chesterfield. This would be safest and most practical option and should be evaluated and discussed with the cycling advocacy groups and community. Again, please consider utilizing the community-based com utilizing the community-based subject matter experts in cycling to address future changes to bike lanes and bike path. Thank you. Uh, Chair, this was the last um, email we had on this specific topic. Okay, commissioners, who wants to go first? Could, could we go back so we can see each other, please? I just have the uh, screen with Chesterfield and all of that. There we go. Thank you. Okay, Peter, this is Commissioner Lashiness. Go ahead, sir. First off, I uh, want to thank Abe and all of the people who wrote in on this. As I think everyone would agree, there is not a perfect solution here. You know, if there was, uh, the, that's obviously what we would want to do. But how we got to this point was attempting to see if there was not no solution that will allow us to have a bike lane from K Street all the way down to the improvements on South 101 in the south direction. And so that is exactly uh, what occurred. And what we've come up with is a proposal. And, you know, I appreciate Abe's identification of uh, the objectives that need to be met. First off is that the engineering standards for this proposal that we're talking about, uh, the safety requirements must be met. And the current proposal that he has suggested complies uh, with those. However, uh, you know, it is, uh, it is not a perfect solution. And I am very uh, sensitive to the feedback that we have gotten from the community about the potential for injury as car doors are opened into this bike lane. So, you know, then it becomes an issue of balance from my perspective. So we've come up with a proposal to have a bike lane, as I said, from K Street on south on down. The solution is one that meets the minimum safety requirements, but it, it is inherently dangerous. 
you know, I kind of am at the position where I appreciate that work that was done and the analysis, but I don't feel comfortable with it. And so then where does that leave us? I think it leaves us with two options. One is approve this proposal, recognizing some of the inherent risks. Second one is, okay, we had this objective of trying to come up with a flight plan in the south direction, but we were constrained. We knew we were going to be constrained financially and also constrained in terms of the actual geography that needed to be worked with. So the second option then becomes do nothing or the Shara's only solution. And I think I am leaning in that direction of, you know, we attempted to look at what the bike lane option was. There is a minimal solution. It is dangerous. I think I would rather wait and we have the money to do something that is right or just leave it like it is, or as some of these folks have proposed, just do Shara's the entire route down. And I think that is kind of the way I view it at this point. We have those two options. Pursue the proposed bike lane that is less than optimal or do nothing Shara's. And I'm leaning towards that ladder. Thank you, sir. Who is going next? Can I go, Peter? All right. Dave, thank you for presenting this. As many of you know, I've been talking about getting some sort of bike facility on this stretch probably since I joined the public safety commission. I think ideally here, we would just do a road diet to match what comes in from the north. And I understand the time constraints associated with that going to the public commission. I wish it were easier. I feel like we've made similar comments in other areas like on that. But understanding that that's not feasible and just listening to the staff report and the public comment, you know, I'm kind of inclined to, I understand the issues associated with what was done in the media where a door zone buffer was put in and that a lot of people use that as a two foot bike lane. I think nowadays fewer people would use that. And I think it did achieve the goal of slowing down traffic because you create additional friction by narrowing the lane. And that I think is the big thing that I at least wanted to see accomplished along this stretch where you have effectively a 16 foot at some point lane. It's the same issue that we had on Intermediate Boulevard maybe five years ago when we wanted buffers added to the bike lanes on Intermediate Boulevard. Since it wasn't first and foremost to protect the cyclists, they were already way off to the side in a bike lane. It was more to slow down traffic, which inherently makes those cyclists move. So I'm kind of leaning toward, let's get this to the city approach. If you look at the whole corridor, I'm looking at it on Google Earth right now, it's that outside lane is a variable width. And so you would need a variable width buffer. You would have to move that center line, get 10 foot travel lanes south. And then just get a variable width buffer to maintain that. And if the 10 mile per hour beach cruisers want to go ride in that non-bike lane buffer, they can do so. And if the cyclists, sports cyclists, people who are going 25 miles an hour in a group of 20 want to use the lane, they can use it because we'll have zero down just like in the basement. So that's kind of what I'm inclined to right now. It sounds kind of similar to what you said, Charlie. I just wanted to give a little bit of background on why I support that and why I think the buffer itself is critical. If you don't put the buffer in, you're not really creating any additional friction for those motor vehicles, and they're just going to go as fast as they are right now. And while a lot of the Peloton cyclists that ride this very regularly on weekends feel comfortable on that outside lane, they feel comfortable because they're going 25 miles an hour. And someone on a beach cruiser or someone just trying to go 10 to 15 miles an hour doesn't 
tell him nowhere to go, and they're probably running in the door zone anyway. They're sure as heck not running in the middle of the lane. So I think by putting in a park your door zone buffer, which here we can achieve something between four and six feet on my read, um, those folks can go in there and be faster cyclists than use the Cheryl lane, which we would be creating. That's my two cents recommendation. Thank you, sir. Who else? I'll speak, Commissioner Benson. Uh, I, I agree with Charlie and, and Brian. Um, I, I hear, Abe, I hear your, uh, your trade-off of only having 900 feet of this, uh, or and then a little bit at the other end, of this uh, pr particularly patently dangerous uh, bike lane. I have been doored. I went over my handlebars and then bike hit me in the back of the head uh, about 12 years ago. It's um, a huge problem, and it is a problem. It's something that's really difficult to teach to cyclists who even have experience. Um, but my personal experience right now, the difference between driving through uh, Lucadia uh, southbound in those Sharrows and riding in the area that we're talking about right now in uh, northern San Alijo that has no Sharrow and a huge super wide lane, the big difference is I don't feel like I have the defense of the signage behind me. If a motorist feels like harassing me in Lucadia, there's tons of signage on the street and beside the street that tells them to stop doing that. And that's just not there. And I see people riding in the door zone in Lucadia, but they have the option not to, and they have the defense of the, uh, the signage there. And in Cardiff, through this area that we're, that's in question, the specific area that's in question, I honestly, I've ridden dozens and dozens of thousands of miles in tons of different states, and I'm not even sure where to put myself right now. And I think that the buffer uh, for the interim right now, and, and of course, like Brian, if I had my druthers, we would uh, either eliminate some parking right there so that we wouldn't have this problem, or even better, we'd, we'd create a road diet so that we'd have one lane in each direction. But we can't do that, it's not feasible. And so I think that the best interim uh, the best interim solution is what Charlie, Brian, and most of these uh, commentators that wrote in public comment are saying. Thank you, sir. Who wants to go next? Uh, Commissioner Von Neumann. Uh, in, uh, in your uh, presentation, Abe, or what was written and everything, you said that in the near future, when the roadway undergoes a slurry seal, what is a near future in your mind? Um, I did ask our um, CIP group uh, for um, an update on this. Um, I don't have the um, exact date. Um, however, uh, the unfortunate situation is even with the slurry, the areas where we have 32, slurry will not solve our problem. In other areas, um, like northbound, the slurry would help us to be able to convert the number one lane to 10 feet wide lanes. Uh, basically, everything can go down to 10 uh, with the slurry. But the, but the area is that, that we have only 32, slurry won't really help. We have to touch the median to be able to resolve that issue. So, I mean, there's a couple of sections of this road where there's a raised median. I mean, if that raised median is removed, doesn't that give us more room to work with? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that, that will change the whole situation. We'll have a lot more room to do a uh, basically a perfect project that everybody's happy with. But uh -huh. modifying the median and increasing the, the pavement width, that's a, that's a major CIP project. The slurry seal, well, I guess we can add on to a slurry seal, uh, an item that would... Uh, talk about removal of the median or narrowing down or shaving the median, but uh, at the moment with our constraint and the fact that that has never been on our radar to fund, uh, I won't anticipate uh, this something like that happening for at least 18 months from now. Well, I, I, I think uh, moving ahead, uh, rather than just slurry sealing uh, what, what is there that we should, that it should be looked at doing that in conjunction with removing those raised medians and that therefore being able to do a lot more to satisfy a lot of people. 
but I foresee that way down the road, quite frankly. And so we're talking about in the interim period. And I'm very uncomfortable with having a five foot bike lane next to curbside parking. So I think I agree with uh, some of the other the, the people who have written in and also with Marty and Brian and Charlie that uh, by all means buffer what you can, buffer the bike lanes wherever you can and narrow the lanes to 10 feet. And I'm not quite sure about you know where to install sharrows or not, but perhaps that's the way to go. But definitely narrow the number two lane and put in bike buffer lanes wherever possible and definitely drop the five foot bike lane next to any kind of uh, uh, curbside parking. That's my thoughts on this. Yeah, I, I guess uh, one of the issues here is that people uh, feel they're entitled to free parking uh, all along there. And if we got rid of all the parking, uh, we could uh, do a lot uh, to make things better for the bicycles and the cars. But then people would complain that there's no parking. Uh, it's a real quandary. I, I came in thinking, gosh, this is going to be an improvement. But I'm seeing all the difficulties that are likely to come up. And uh, I'm not sure I can support that plan. Well, can you support the suggestion that was made by uh, some of the other commissioners? Yes. I mean, the, the plan that we've got here is just too much. We, we can't have the, the, the door zone next to, uh, with the bike lane and all the traffic. If we, if we go with a lane diet, uh, then we have more space for the parking and the bike lanes. And along there, I think all the places where it's four lane road uh, could just as well be a two lane road carry about the same amount of traffic. It's not limited by the capacity of the road or the volume of traffic. Right? But keep in mind that in case of emergency, that road is going to be a major artery to get people out of town. And I don't know if you really want to take the chance to cut again down to one travel lane in each direction. I think in that kind of emergency, I'm not sure which way they would go. What kind of emergency are you planning for? Uh, Chair, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to uh, mention something. Um, the most important factor when we talk about a road diet there and removal of parking uh, is obviously the fact that it's in Coastal Commission, the Coastal Zone, and um, any kind of a capacity uh, impacting scenario would need coastal approval and would need an environmental analysis associated with it. So it's not a decision that we can make right here. Even one single parking space being removed over there is beyond this commission's authority. Well, that's not good. Mary, do you but have any comment? I, I support what Brian and Marty and, and uh, Charlie and Michael said. Um, let's send it back to the, to the engineer and I really like the 10, year, 10 foot lanes. That's excellent. And I, all bikers are very, very in grave danger, in fact, of death if, in their, if they're in the door zone and the door is open. So I think there's a pretty unanimous feeling here, though I have not heard from Peter yet today. I'm chicken. <laughs> I, I, can I, can I, jump I in have again? a question uh, on southbound north 101 where you really only have the two foot door zone do we have have we had a lot of accidents there anybody um, know you mean the the north coast 101 yeah going southbound no i, I don't think i don't think we've had uh at least during my two years i'm not sure if i've heard i think there was one right before i started where we were advice on add additional signage and add to the density of those cross hatches by the commission, but I don't think there was anything during the past two years. At least, I don't think there's anything on record. So, is, uh, there's a couple of things that bother me. Number one, the people that wrote in uh, 
belonging to different organizations, they don't seem to agree on which is the best way. And, uh, but it, to me, it makes sense, uh, and I agree with uh, the other commissioners, that may be the best way of doing that in the interim, and let's say down the road when we have some more funding available, maybe take out the center and just restripe it, move lanes and so on. But uh, it'll come up with a near-term solution. I mean, our budgets, all cities are going to lose a lot of money because there are no sales tax and so on coming in. And I see where that's going to have a rather negative effect in some of the projects that we're thinking about doing. I, I have another question, if I may, Commissioner Von Neumann. Uh, hey, on, on, on the, on the uh, uh, southbound section, if we take the uh, number two travel lane to 10 feet, would, uh, are you talking about uh, painting an edge line, a lane edge line there? Um, let, me, let me share the file again. Like this, like like uh, af after the current bike, like the, the, the current bike lane that is that is there next to the uh, uh, the pylons or whatever. When that ends, where does where does the ten foot number two lane start, and how how is that uh, identified as that's the travel lane? Um, I'm not sure if I if I understand correctly. So we have a ten footer lane. Um, number two, right now, like this is the end of uh, the parking lane north of the entrance to the parking lot. In the, at the enter at the end of it, we have a nine-foot parking lane and a seven-footer bike lane. Uh, because it widens up, we have been able to have like a comfortable parking lane, uh, bike lane adjacent to it. Um, so it becomes a dash because vehicles in the number two should be able to get into the um, right turn into the parking lot. Then the bike lane, we have the bike lane again adjacent to it, will be like a cross hashed area or non cross hashed area. Um, this is like 10, 12 feet wide right now. It's five plus another seven, eight or something that we're not showing. Um, with the shadow scenario, we'll put shadows in the 10 feet um, wide lane, and this relatively wide, 10, 11 feet wide area. Uh, will have to be cross-hatched to clarify it is not a lane. We don't want people to confuse it with a lane. But there will my, my, my question was, like, when, when, when the southbound number two lane is taken down to 10 feet, are you, are, is it, are you proposing that an edge line, a lane edge line, will be painted? With the share scenario? But there, isn't, there isn't an edge line there now next to the number two lane after after the uh, from the north end of the campground down to Chesterfield there is not a painted edge line road ed lane edge line well to form um, if, if this is if this is what you're talking about um, we are we are in this obviously in this scenario uh, that we have a bike lane we're showing a buffer that widens the south one from 10 to 20 and the 20 becomes two lanes. If we are going to go with shadows, this line will continue, will still widen from 10 to 20 and make it two lanes. But then the remaining space between this line and the curb will be crosshatched. Basically, it will be no man's land. Right, but there, there will be a painted edge line for the number two lane. Yes. Yeah, okay, because there isn't now. Well, it is there now. It's basically th this line that my mouse is on, this line will stay. This line okay. that is the outer lane of the bike lane right now, this will become the, the edge lane that you mentioned. Okay, I understand. All right. Well, I'm, I'm definitely in fa favor of narrowing the lanes and uh, no, no, no five-foot bike lane. 
something uh, something chair that I'd like to mention for for the record uh, thank you for the input uh, obviously I'm, I'm totally fine with Commission's recommendation I'll, I'll need some clarification which I'll ask uh, in a few minutes something that I'd like to mention for the record this has been mentioned by uh, a few of our commissioners that a door zone um, bike lane is very dangerous and can cause death and it's very it, it puts people in grave danger uh, as the engineer in charge of the division I want to uh, say that I respectfully disagree a bike lane adjacent to a parked car has caused collision as mentioned in my report it can cause it has caused around 20 percent of the whole collisions of bikes but that does not mean that all the bike lanes adjacent to door zones are putting bicyclists in grave danger. That's not a correct statement uh, in, in an engineering perspective. Again, it's not a preferred option, but if we consider all the bike lanes adjacent to parked cars uh, that we're putting all the bicyclists in grave danger, we have to go out and remove all those around town, which I'm pretty sure that's not the direction that the city, that the commission wants the city to take. They meet their standards, there are thousands of miles of bike lanes adjacent to parked cars around the country. Nobody is removing those, as far as I know. So just for the record, because we don't want to put a city in a situation that the traffic commissioners of the city believe that the bike lanes adjacent to parked cars are very dangerous and can cause harm to city's bicyclists. I hope that's not the position of the commission. If it is, please direct us to basically do something accordingly. Just want to clarify that. With regards to the commission, commission suggesting shadows, I need some. I, I need some clarification. Uh, I, uh, if if chair allows, I'll, I'll like to ask some questions to make sure I get it right. Yes, go ahead. Could you put us back on so we can see each other, please? Um, my my questions, I gotta ask them um, on the plan. If if that's okay, I'll I'll bring you guys back. Um, so so to make sure. We are making the whole thing a shadow, um, not only in areas like the, the, the 900 feet Commissioner Benson is the total area, not like, like we have a 900 feet section that is parking lane and then another couple hundred feet further south. The 900 feet that I mentioned is the total uh, length of the area where we don't have um, um, enough width for, for bike lane, both of the segments. But the suggestion from Commission to put shadows is not just for that 900. We are dropping the bike lane basically the whole stretch. Is that correct? That's how I understood it. Okay. Correct. Surely. So, my, my understanding, I think that, um, I, Abe, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily, I, don't, I certainly don't disagree with you that uh, there are tons of bike lanes in the door zone. And I do believe that they are safer than not having any bicycle infrastructure. Uh, I also take to heart your admonition that it's probably not a good idea to go from bike lane to Shero to bike lane to Shero back and forth over and over again. Um, I am really honestly on the fence as to whether a variable width buffer is uh, safer, uh, obviously, in the in the in the locations where the bike lane would be outside of the door zone, that is a highly preferable scenario to a share of. Um, but I I'm willing to I, I like the idea of having a bike lane uh, that's not in a door zone everywhere that we can. I don't want to go back and forth from one piece of infrastructure to another, and I. I'm on the fence about what the trade-off is in terms of the of the safety of having, uh, you know, 900 feet of door zone bike lane where we can have better infrastructure everywhere else than share of, as opposed to having a variable width uh, buffer for the entire uh, length. I would like to keep the same piece of infrastructure, and I think that. Um, a per personally, for me, it seems like it's kind of a wash in terms of the overall safety of the of the corridor in in the the corridor in question. Uh, I'd like to either I'd like to either see what you exactly what you've proposed 
or a variable width, like, uh, excuse me, a variable width buffer can share those and be, uh, like me, useful lengths on for the entire stretch here. Grover, and, and just to be clear, I, I'm uh, advocating for the latter of what Marty just said, a variable width buffer where you maintain a sense of travel length and the variance is, is uh, right in that. Marty, just to address what you brought up, I think we've struggled with that as a commission in the past. Um, I know that it came up on Northbound 101 in the um, where there was the option to have Sharrows, but then it got wide enough to be a bike lane, and then it had to go back to Sharrows, and we were kind of struggling with the same thing. The, the concern that I have is if you try to turn the Sharrows into a bike lane to the stretch where there's no parking, and then pop it back out to Sharrows where there's parking again, cyclists who are now in a bike lane, presumably, then you convert back uh, into the number two lane. So they're looking over their left shoulder, trying to, you know, hoping that a car is going 45 miles an hour. It's it's not safe. It's almost doubly safe. Put them into that safer facility, but then ask them to merge back into the. It, it, it just creates an So I prefer the continuity of just sharing for this whole stretch, and let's try to achieve some traffic calming. And ideally, you know, we can start a longer term vision for this corridor, like I've heard some of my fellow commissioners say. And, you know, I, I guess like every time we, we hear, oh, well, it's with the commission, or, you know, it's, it's going it's to be this process. <laughs> we got to start that at some point. Otherwise, we're just never going to see some of these things. So, um, but, but anyway, that, that's kind of my recommendation is that we just put in a buffer exactly like the Giga, but it's going to be more than twice as wide. In some cases, it's wider than that. Um, so, you know, people, this is a really weird area where people currently put their surfboards in the pedestrian, cruiser, whatever you call that path right next to the campground. So it sort of renders that path a little bit useless from a leisurely cyclist perspective. Some people put their boards on the other side of their car. Um, so it really just needs to be a buffer. And if people want to like, want to ride their bicycle in it or run in it or walk in it, they just need to be aware that there might be doors opening, there might be surfboards, there might be things happening there where you shouldn't be going 25 miles an hour. Like, you want to do that, go in the Sierra lane that we're talking about. So, you want to put that in form of a motion? Oh, shoot. OK. Um, well, and, and before I do, I just want to, um, Gabe, I, I do really appreciate you bringing this to us. And, and I think what you propose is the best solution to get a bike lane in there. I think that, that um, you know, this is the, the best place for a bike lane, which might sound ironic because I've been asking for so long. So I do appreciate you bringing this to us. I think that what we're all talking about does improve the corridor in the same way that, that narrowing the travel lanes and the media did improve the corridor. We did that a couple of years ago to look at how, how much lower the speeds are now. Um, so it's all about those incremental changes, and this seems like the best thing to do right now. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I would make a motion to amend staff's recommendation, and rather than providing for a five-foot bike lane and a parking lane adjacent to it, provide a variable width buffer along the entire corridor with bike and useful lane signage and strip. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, before I call for vote, I need to ask Abe one question, which has nothing to do with bikes. Abe, at the exit and entrance to the overnight campground, would it be possible northbound to put a left turn, uh, a left turn lane or a left turn pocket in there, because right now you have to go to the day use campground, make a U turn, and come back. Can we just vote on the motion that has been seconded? Well, it's all still fresh in our mind. I, I'm not sure. Hey, uh, 
Sorry about that. Uh, all in favor of the motion? I, I tell I, you, I'm going to call for a individual vote on this. Amanda, could you please do that? Chair, sure. uh, before you vote, may I may I make sure because because uh, Commissioner Grover was uh, I'm I'm not sure if it's our reception or if it's his microphone. Uh, I want to make sure I, I got it right. So basically, starting from uh, where the road starts to widen uh, right after the guardrail, um, we will uh, where, where the where the current bike lane ends. We want to go from Cheryl, starting from here, and we keep the lanes at 10, but uh, whatever extra width that we have, with or without parking, it will become an edge line crosshatch. Like this is right right now where my where where my mouse is. We have a parking lane, and then it becomes a red curb when it gets to the toward the parking lot. So in all this area that we're showing the bike lane now, the crosshatches will extend to the second line to basically to the uh, edge line that Commissioner Van Newman mentioned. So we'll have a uh, 12 or 13 footer wide uh, cross hatched edge um, in all this area because we don't have a parking. Again, we have a red curb here. So the cross hatches will be longer. We won't have two parallel lines. We only have the edge line of the 10 footer lane and these cross hatches will be extended to form a super wide uh, cross hatched edge on the road. Um, in these areas, obviously, that we have parking, uh, the crosshatch would be the door zone. Correct. Okay. So sorry, it's hard to hear me. You guys, do I need to speak up, or I, I wasn't, I, I wasn't aware that you guys could hear me. Uh, I don't know if uh, everybody else hearing hearing Commissioner Grover fine, because we're we're having a little bit of disruption. Well, his uh, connection doesn't seem to be real strong. It's the signal breaks a little bit. You're loud enough, but you're, you're, it, it is difficult to follow. Uh, but understood. Okay, can we go ahead and vote on the motion? Yes. Okay, Amanda, do you want to do a roll call motion set up, please? Uh, sure. Chair Peter Cole? Aye. Vice Chair Brian Grover? Aye. Mary Schultz? Yes. Marty Benson? Aye. Michael Von Neumann? Yes. Charlie Leishinus? Aye. Glenn Johnson? Aye. Okay, motion carries seven to nothing. Peter, uh, Commissioner Leishinus, one last comment if I might. Go ahead. Could you uh, please appreciate the screen? Uh, sure. Thank you. Dave, I appreciated your comment for the record about the fact that uh, there, the adjacency of a bike lane next to uh, a car open buffer is uh, not inherently dangerous and and furthermore I just I wanted to make sure that uh, there is no misunderstanding that we are not uh, to uh, make that claim in terms of the reason why we uh, voted against this this is due to the particular topography and set of issues that are uh, at play in, in this one particular stretch. So uh, I want to agree with your point. We're not making an extrapolation from this one instance more broadly against uh, that uh, configuration of bike lane and car door buffer. So thank you for putting that on the record. And I just wanted to also go on the record and saying we are not that generic sort of a statement. Thank you. Are we, are we ready to go to item 7B? I have one question here. With the larger crosshairs, we're going to keep that as a place. Maybe 
Hey Mary, when you do that, you might want to mute your mic so we don't hear all the noise. Uh, can you please repeat, Commissioner Johnson? I, I had a hard time hearing. Okay, I was, I was asking with the larger crosshatched areas, uh, they look like an invitation to park there. Uh, would they be permitted parking uh, for diagonal parking, perhaps, or would that be a no parking zone? Um, no, Commissioner. In the areas of crosshatch, we already have red curbing there. Uh, those red curbings, uh, I checked. Apparently, those are for uh, our fire department's emergency response um, to the area. So there are there are a few stretches where we have relatively long um, red curbings. Uh, those are obviously no parking areas. Okay, can we move on? Please. Okay, let's go to item 7B. Thank you, Chair. So item um, 7B is, um, uh, we, we did discuss this a few times. It was one of the items on our log. Um, when streetscape was approved, uh, now this is obviously, as commissioners know, is a is a very long um, has a very long history. But uh, there were conditions of approval for uh, bo both coastal commission uh, had put some conditions on the approval of the project, and also the city council when the project was approved. Uh, there were some conditions for the project. Um, one of the conditions was to implement certain measures of traffic calming uh, in advance of a street escape to assure um, the potential um, impact that the street escape can have on Vulcan uh, will be mitigated with these improvements. Um, there are two different ways uh, of, of looking at improving Vulcan. One is to build a whole new road. As I'm sure you know, the road is not in perfect shape. Uh, it hasn't been... Um, repaved uh, for a relatively long time. There are drainage issues, I'm sure, as residents of the city, you're aware of that. Um, we did discuss this. There are a few uh, ongoing studies um, for Vulcan. One is the old uh, stormwater drainage evaluation uh, to find out um, what to do with the stormwater along the stretch. Uh, obviously, you're aware of the double tracking situation. Uh, which side of the current track will be the future uh, second track and how it would impact uh, the design of Vulcan and also the future segment of CRT, uh, the rail trail, uh, how it would be impacted by the double tracking and how we can fit in the CRT um, in this area and how these working together will impact the future design of Vulcan. All these different studies being underway and nothing really being 100% final and designed uh, makes us not be able to basically redesign uh, Vulcan and rebuild Vulcan 100%. Uh, so we have to wait for the drainage analysis to be finalized, double tracking, CRT design, uh, before we can know what the ultimate center line of Vulcan will be. Um, However, because uh, Street Escape is a go and it's, it's going forward and we anticipate it being, uh, you know, we have, you know, hopefully shovel in the ground very soon, uh, we have to do some improvements on Vulcan to make things a bit better. Uh, with this project that I'm presenting to commission, we're not uh, considering, again, we're not considering overlay and repaving the road and rebuilding the road uh, from the base. Um, let me share this screen. Um, this is Vulcan North at La Costa. We're not, we're not considering um, rebuilding the roadway and um, repaving the roadway. We're just restrapping the roadway and implementing, again, some traffic calming measures and enhancing uh, some um, some pedestrian uh, 
maneuvers and making some stuff easier for pedestrians and and maybe even bikers um, along the stretch. Uh, the goal of this project was to again narrow down the lanes on Vulcan using the existing uh, pavement width that we have, which is really limited, and provide this edge of the road enhancement per our active transportation plan that allows uh, people being able to uh, walk on the edge of the road where we have 36 inches or more of available um, pavement width adjacent to the edge of the road. Um, we're also um, providing a few race crosswalks uh, slash speed tables along the roadway that provides access to the residents on the east side to these um, newly constructed parking pods on the west side of Vulcan. I'm sure you've noticed there are a few areas that the city, after signing some sort of an agreement with NCTD, have been able to um, pave the area and improve the area on the west side of road and provide parking for the residents. So these um, uh, raised crosswalks will serve dual purposes, both act as a traffic calming device uh, and also provide better visibility for pedestrians crossing on the road, um, obviously over a raised crosswalk. Um, the cross-section changes, but overall it's very simple. We're narrowing down the lanes and leaving space on both sides. Um, this is specific area, um, north of Andrew, um, we are forming the walkway on the west side. This is one of the, uh, right at Andrew, this is one of the raised crosswalks. Narrowing down the lanes and then uh, forming a walkway on the west side. It's very limited space that we have. As you can see, the edge of the road um, width that we have available, even with a 10 and a half footer curve, a 10 and a half footer lane on a curve is very limited. It's like five, in some areas it's three feet. But we wanted to provide this width because pedestrians are better visible being on the outside curve. So we wanted to put them, um, put the pet pass basically on the west side in this stretch north of Andrews. And uh, walking toward the beach, going over the bridge is easier if the walkway is on this side too. So in this specific small stretch north of Andrew, uh, the walkway is on the west side. But uh, the whole length of Vulcan from Encinitas Boulevard all the way up to Andrew, the, we tried to push all, uh, well, not all, just the two, push the two travel lanes as much as possible to the west and basically tie the two lanes to the edge of the, to the western edge of the road and open up a space on the east side. The fact that our residences are all on the east side, we thought it would be better to provide a walking, jogging, um, I don't know, safe stroller moving area on the east side of Vulcan along, uh, on the east side of Vulcan along this stretch. We thought it would be better to have it on the east side. So a simple example is here just south of Andrew. As you can see, we only had 24 feet. We moved both of the lanes to the west side, basically as close as possible to the edge, and releasing four feet on the east side. This four feet, again, is not perfect, but it meets our standards, and uh, somebody who is jogging or running or, or a mom with a stroller, they can use this four feet of space. This is a paved area, but there's also dirt adjacent to it. They can use this to uh, safely walk along the road. And now these two white lines that are edge lines and the double yellow, all of them are new striping. We would have to remove the existing center line of the road, water blast it or something, or grind it um, to be able to restripe the road and move the lanes toward west. Uh, the current center line of the road does not allow for these measures to be implemented. Um, again, simple cross section, 10, 10, four feet on the east side in front of the residences to be used as a walkway. Uh, in some areas, we don't even have four. It goes down. Uh, this is Ashbury where we have a, a improved area. This is where we have a sidewalk. The development um, has built a sidewalk. So this is basically right an edge line, and we have a wide parking lane. But in this area, we have a um, sidewalk already. When we get down uh, further south, uh, right north of Hillcrest is where we have five feet of 
um, edge of the road enhancement again this is Hillcrest as you can see 10 feet 10 feet and a 5 feet edge uh, we have 5 feet edge in some areas we have less than that we have 3 some areas the wood is so narrow south of Sanford we have 6 feet of edge uh, but again the concept is the same we are narrowing down the lanes to 10 and moving everything to the western edge to open up a space on the eastern side um, yeah here as you can see we only had 22 feet of available width so we're even um, shorter than our uh, three feet um, ATP recommended edge of the road enhancement so this is this this small stretch is even lower than our um, current ATP standard um, but again that's basically what what we have we don't have anything anything more so there is a stretch that we only have 22 but then again it becomes 24 and now we have four feet again so this is um, and this is Lucadia south of Lucadia again same treatment lanes are down to 10 um, Uh, I think I passed one crosswalk, if I'm not mistaken. But there is another one here on Union, another uh, existing crosswalk. 10 feet, 10 feet, 5 feet edge, 6 feet edge. Uh, when we get closer to NCS Boulevard, the roadway widens up, and that's where we had to add a 2 feet. This is area where we have a AC walkway on the west side, uh, south of the school. South of Pauliki, we have a walkway, but... Uh, then again, we had enough room to form a walkway on the east side in front of the residence. Um, that means if they want to walk north, uh, right now they'd have to cross basically to get to the AC walkway on the west side. But with this striping, uh, they'll have uh, a five feet, six feet wide space uh, in front of their properties to walk along the adjacent to the road uh, without having to cross to get to that um, AC walkway on the west side. And this is basically north of Encinas Boulevard, where it kind of narrows down, um, where we basically are narrowing it down from the existing 16, 17 feet wide lanes uh, to a 10 and a half. There is a transition that the lanes narrow down, and we're starting our edge of the road walkway on the east side here. Uh, the numbers you see in these white rectangles are the existing available width. As you can see, it changes a lot. Um, so the majority, more than 90% of the road, I think we've been able to uh, provide a uh, wide enough edge of the road um, enhanced paved area for pedestrians to walk or jog on. The lanes are being narrowed to 10s and 10 and a halves uh, to help with traffic calming. Uh, we're adding a few of these race crosswalks that can help us uh, slow down um, vehicle traffic on the road and also help with um, pedestrian crossing being uh, more visible and safer. Um, that's basically my presentation of this item. I'm, I'm open with that. I'm open to questions. Thank you. Do, have, do we have any public, public comments? Oh, yes, Chair. Thank you for reminding me. We have two on this one. Um, first one, um, Rochelle Collier. I wanted to address an issue I came upon walking in my neighborhood. I live on Hillcrest Drive and have been walking on Vulcan and noticed that the sidewalk situation is pretty bad. So I was happy to see an apartment building at 110 Hillcrest. The corner of Hillcrest and Vulcan was doing a major remodel. I saw people out, out front one day and asked if they were going to put in a sidewalk since they were doing work to the corner area. I was told the city told them not to touch the public right of way. I was a little surprised since we have been talking about putting in sidewalks on Vulcan for years, and finally we seem to be getting needed improvements on Vulcan. I contacted the planner, and she said that the scope of the project did not merit asking the developer to put in a sidewalk. Again, I was surprised. This is a major remodel. Anyway, I was looking at the agenda. I noticed the item regarding Vulcan. Can someone tell me when improvements, when improvements for pedestrians will happen? To me, this was a golden opportunity that flew out the window. However, if the city has a plan for installing sidewalks soon, then perhaps that is why they didn't ask the developer to do when they were doing all the other upgrades. 
Thank you so much for your time. If, if needed, I contact. If needed, I will contact Abe to find out what is happening. He's doing a great job. Oh, sorry, I had to read that for the record. Sincerely, Rachel Collier, 287 Hillcrest Drive, Lucadia. Um, this one from Dolores Lodel. Again, apologies if I'm reading uh, the names wrong. Thank you. Here is my statement. My name is Dolores Lodel, and I lived on Hillcrest Drive for 24 years. I would like to speak in favor of action item 7B, traffic calming measures along Vulcan Avenue between La Costa and Encinitas Boulevard. This is a greatly needed improvement along this stretch of roadway as it is a very dangerous area for pedestrians. Reducing the speed through traffic calming, creating safer areas for crossing, and additional space for pedestrians will be a huge improvement. Thank you. Uh, these two were the only public comments on this, Chair. Commissioners, anybody want to comment? I do. This is my neighborhood, so I'm very excited to see it happening. Um, using raised sidewalks to get people across is, is wonderful. The only question I have is in terms of the intersection of Andrew and um, Vulcan, it's very difficult to make a left-hand turn from Andrew onto Vulcan because so many cars park along that little stretch. Are you going to do anything about parking there so that the, the visibility there is, is improved? Uh, we, we can definitely look into that. Um, we do we do handle these corner side distances all the time in different areas of town. Um, I'll, be, I'll be happy to ask our um, team members to take a look at the corner and see if any red curbing is needed. Thank you. Where else? Michael, Com yeah. Yeah. Commissioner Von Um I, I think it's a great, great idea, a great plan. Uh, I think a lot of people in that area have been asking for some traffic calming measures, and, and one of them is about speed. I don't know what the current speed limit that is, that is there right now, but what I mean, is there any thought about getting that speed limit lowered to 25, and uh, that kind of in conjunction with perhaps reclassifying the area between La Costa and Lucadia for sure as a residential neighborhood? Yes, um, we last year we did a speed survey and lowered the stretch. Uh, we have been able to lower it by five miles again using that traffic engineers option. Um, hopefully, with these uh, measures implemented, we'll be able to redo a survey. And because I remember, if I'm not mistaken, the area south of Lucadia we were able to lower to 30. North of Lucadia, I think it has stayed at 35. If I'm not mistaken, I might be wrong. It might be reversed, but. Uh, with these measures, we might be able to lower it again by redoing another survey. Uh, with regards to reclassifying it and classifying it as a residential district, I did have a meeting with our attorneys. Uh, it's, it's one of our log items. I had a meeting with our attorneys. I provide, they provided me some directions on what to look for. Um, I'm studying it a bit more. Um, it, it's, it seems like an option. Again, I'm not 100% positive at the moment that we can classify uh, their, their, their old way as a residential district, but it might be an option. If we are able to classify it, uh, obviously we need council approval to become a residential district, uh, but, but the good thing is we can after post it as prima facie 25. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Commissioner Cole, I was going to ask a similar question that Mr. Von Neumann asked. It seems to me if we're doing this restriping and moving the travel lanes to the west, that would be a great opportunity to try and get all this area classified as residential and we'll get the speed limit down to 25. Do you need a motion from us to um, Chair, I'm still investigating this about the legal, what, what does it entail to, to classify it as a residential? Because as you know, we have similar cases in many areas of town. We have classified roads on our general plan. Uh, the roadway is classified. Now, does this classification as a residential district 
uh, line up with our classification, our general plan. Another example could be San Alejo. Like, it's a very similar case. But these roads are all classified in our general plan. So if we convert them to residential district, uh, how does that legally work with regards to enforcement? Like, let's say a ticket is issued based on 25, it goes to court. There is a, there is a council approved document that is our circulation element that classified the road as non-residential. And there is another document that says this residential district was established here. And because of that, we have a 25 mile per hour speed limit. So how these two can work with each other, that's a little bit um, tough to understand. And I'm, I'm trying to get help from our attorneys. They've, gave, they've given me some homeworks, but, but we'll get there. I, I'm not sure at the moment we need any kind of a motion on that. Mary, who is the council person for that area? Tony Kranz. Maybe we need to enlist his help to try and get that. But uh, uh, do, uh, Abe, do you want a motion to approve that proposal? The striping proposal, I should say. Um, it, 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 I, the, the, the recommendation on the, on the item is to provide input and comments. Because uh, we do these uh, striping projects uh, around town, and many of them don't come to commission. So I didn't want to make it in any way different that this one needs approval from the commission. Because it's within the rights of the division to basically restrap and implement traffic calming measures. We do, we do a lot of these, like... Um, like the one on, on Village Parkway, the one that Commissioner Van Newman mentioned, uh, I did present it to commission as a presentation item. I showed the plans, but I didn't ask for approval from the commission. But we went out and did it anyway, and I, I think it was a good project. So we have a lot of these that we do around town. Um, the ones that I feel very comfortable, there are not that many different scenarios or variations. Um, I, I don't bring here. I just bring them as a presentation item. The ones that I feel like, like the previous one where commission had a lot of input and comment and suggested changes, these ones I bring, again, it doesn't necessarily need commission approval to be implemented. We can go ahead and do it. Uh, the recommendation on the report was to provide input and comment. But if commissioners want to move and want to have a motion and approve this, that's totally fine too. Well, commissioners, how do you feel? I don't see a need for a motion. He, he heard us. <laughs> well, I think we all agree it's a good thing, right? Yeah. Okay. Let's go to uh, follow-up log, item number eight. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, not much on the log. Um, the Vulcan and La Costa, we did talk about it. Um, the design is going forward. Um, as soon as it's uh, past 90%, uh, at 90%, I'll bring it back to commission for review and comment. Um, funding is an issue at the moment. Um, I really uh, like that signal to happen, so I'll do my best to uh, find funding for it, uh, hopefully soon. Um, Vulcan Avenue, the next item, item number 18, is Vulcan Avenue reclassification. Um, as mentioned, I'm working on this. Hopefully, I'll have an answer soon. Um, but we do need a, a few back and forths with our attorneys and our risk management team. Um, item 21, the Blackland and Shadows on uh, 101 uh, south of Suomis is what we discussed today. Um, Number 22 uh, was uh, suggested by commission at our last meeting uh, after traffic calming measures implemented on Piraeus. It was suggested that we conduct another speed survey along Piraeus to see what the new speed limit can be. However, because of COVID, I'm a little bit hesitant on doing new surveys on roads um, before everything is back to normal. Um, it could be a double-edged sword. It could be, um, you know, it could be leading us to a lower speed, but at the same time, it could end up becoming higher. So I don't want to risk it. Those are those are the four items that we have on the log at the moment. Okay. Anybody have any comment? Not. Let's move on to commission. I, 
But I have one comment. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. I mentioned this earlier when Gabe was talking about the projects that are going on about South Willow Spring Drive. And I do, I, I'd like to know if any other commissioners would agree to put that uh, on the law so that we can keep track of it. Any comment one way or another? I don't see any harm in that. I think it's a good idea. Okay. I agree. I think we need one more. Wait a minute, that's three. Okay. It's going to be on the law. Okay. Anything Thank you. Anything else? If, or if not, we'll go to item number nine, Commissioner Corner. Anybody have anything? If I have one question. At uh, our May meeting, there were a lot of uh, letters regarding doing something on uh, Balour. Do you have anything for us on that? So for Balour, um, as you recall, uh, there was a petition for a um, speed cushion um, Tier one program on that road. Um, however, with the uh, warrant analysis that has been done at that point, the street did not qualify. Now, the street, as you know, we've recently implemented bike lanes, buffers, narrowed down the lanes to 10 feet, a lot of signage and striping work on the road, um, and it seems to be it seems to be working pretty good. I mean, I see a lot of bicyclists using that, a lot of students. Um, but it didn't meet our warrants. Uh, what I uh, mentioned to commission last time was we will, we, we're, we're able, we're authorized to basically redo the counts and redo the warrant analysis. If for any reason we feel like, um, yeah, maybe something was going on at that point where we didn't have the volumes or the speeds and the speed on the road is really worse than what we caught. At, uh, at that situation, I think a couple of months back when it was evaluated, the speed was the 85th percentile, I think, was only like 28 or 29 or something. Um, but we can reevaluate, and that's what I'm planning on doing. Again, similar to other cases, uh, we're waiting for a, for a normal situation to be back before redoing surveys and collecting speed and volume data. At the moment, it's not a good representative. Okay, thank you. One other question. The seven stop signs we approved last May, have they gone before council? I believe they're set for June 17th. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions or comments? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. We have a second. Uh, one even seconds. All in favor? Aye. I oppose none. Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much, commissioners. Good night. Thanks, guys.